So thanks so much for joining us. Um, just for introductory purposes, I'm Marion Scher. I'm a director at Conflict Dynamics. And the producer of this, of this um, meeting is Craig um, Holscher, who you all know um, from Conflict Dynamics as well. So Craig is in the background organizing all the um, technology aspects. So if you have an issue, please feel free to WhatsApp him as well, because he'll, he'll be able to help you to get on or get off or, or manage your, your system. Thanks, Craig, for that. Um, the background of, of Conflict Dynamics' involvement in this whole area of medical malpractice and personal injury mediation um, really has been, has been for a while when we first got mediators trained, accredited mediators trained, specifically in the area of me medical malpractice because we saw this developing elsewhere in the world and how useful it is to have sensible and efficient dispute resolution in the arena. And we trained, we trained mediators in order to, to mediate those issues. We've also been lobbying um, to encourage the use of mediation and working with other organizations, um, specifically SAMLA in this case, to, to try and um, develop a practice of mediating um, medical medical legal disputes. So it's really a great joy to have Tony and Heather Allen join us today. Tony and Heather have, between the two of them, mediated hundreds, literally hundreds, of, of medical malpractice um, and personal injury disputes in the UK specifically. And actually, um, Tony's even done one here. Um, but they come with a wealth of, of experience in how to mediate these disputes effectively. And it's really for that reason that we invited them here today to give us a sense of how it's done because we've been advocating, we've been training, we've been um, involved in pilot projects, uh, but the actual mediation hasn't taken off to the extent that it has in the UK. So we still lack that deep experience. And Heather and Tony certainly can give us insight into what that experience looks like. So welcome, Heather and Tony. It's great to have you here. I think what I also need to say is that Heather and Tony come with a lot of, of the South African contextual experience as well. Um, they're not a complete import, let's say, because they've been involved with us since 2007. They were two of the first faculty members to come out um, and train commercial mediators for conflict dynamics in 2007. And since then, Tony has commented on the quarter line mediation rules. He's been involved in commenting on the recent rule 41A. Um, and they, were, they came out specifically to train our medical mediators. So they understand this context and hopefully can give us an insight in, in bringing the experience from the, from specifically England and Wales, um, into the South African context and, and assisting us on how to really unpack that for our own um, context here. So, yeah, I think that gives us a sense of, of where we are and why we're here. Um, I think the reason why this is such an important area is because we've seen how hospitals have, to some extent, being paralyzed by the legal claims against them, which has a massive effect then on, on running an, a, an effective health system um, because budgets are being, are being spent rather than being spent on healthcare, they're being spent on, on legal challenges. So it becomes almost a double-edged sword. Um, and it's a very useful idea to start thinking about how can we have more sensible and more efficient dispute resolution in, a, in an area that is so critical to a society. And I think the timing of this is particularly, um, particularly important given what we're going through and potentially will be going through with COVID-19. So without um, further ado, I'm gonna hand over to, to Tony and Heather to take us through their presentation. Please post your, your questions on chat. We'll be following them and I'll interrupt them every now and then 
to put your questions to them. So over to you, Heather and Tony. Okay. Thank you very much, Marion. Um, I'm Heather Allen. Uh, I see some familiar faces and, and a lot of new friends and colleagues. And one thing that Tony and I just wanted to say very briefly is how excited we are and how pleased we are to be able to share ideas and experience with our friends and colleagues in South Africa. As Marion said, we have a, a, a several years of uh, connection and uh, this is very exciting for us. So thank you for inviting us. Yes, indeed. Let me echo what Heather has to say. It's nice to be back seeing old friends and, and feeling that there is contribution that just possibly we can make to the way you think and, and, and how you might develop in this sphere. Um, I'm going to start by talking about the English co context a bit, uh, and we may take the odd question um, after this, th th this first slide. So um, we'll move on to that now. And let me say a little bit about how we are getting on here in this particular area. Um, thrillingly, um, this is one of the big growth areas of mediation in this jurisdiction. Uh, it's been a long time coming, and so one has to be patient uh, in terms of getting things developed. But it, as I hope I'll be able to explain, it really is beginning to move very quickly and grow very fast. Let me start by just talking about one or two ter bits of terminology. You talk about the medical malpractice, we talk about clinical negligence. Um, I always think that med mal slightly smacks of the USA and also smacks somewhat of the fact that any anything that goes wrong is, is almost a regulatory breach. In other words, a, a deliberate um, act on the part of a clinician, uh, which I think slightly over eggs the, the situation. Many cases, of course, uh, are involve systemic difficulties, uh, momentary inattention, I can think of one case where, where someone just forgot to get a blood test and there were catastrophic consequences down the line. No one ever thought that that was a, 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 a serious, uh, significant conscious act. So anyway, I, I, we will probably talk about clinical negligence, so forgive us on that, but we have tried to change claimant into plaintiff for, uh, so that there's, uh, we, we all talk about claimants here since 1999, but uh, claimant plaintiff, I so hope you'll forgive us if our language slips every now and then. We're, we have one or two pieces of good fortune here in the way things are structured. NHS Resolution is an organisation within the National Health Service, it's a special health service trust, which acts on behalf of all uh, hospital trusts in relation to claims made in the NHS against them, and indeed now uh, against all GPs who are in, 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 in NHS practice. So it's only private medicine now that is separately insured uh, by medical defense organizations and commercial insurers such as the MPS, the MDU, and NDDUS. Um, NHS resolution uh, is able to do so uh, because of something called Crown indemnity, which means that the Crown now uh, vicariously responsible for all acts that go on in any NHS hospitals. So you no longer have to sue the doctor and the nurse and the hospital management where something goes wrong. So that there is a, a very much a clear focus, um, uh, which a, a simplification of the process of issuing proceedings and making claims. There's just, in a sense, one body that's handling a very large amount of the clinical negligence work in, in England. <coughs> um, the, in 2014, NHS Resolution decided to pilot a mediation scheme, which CEDA were, provided a panel of mediators for, and I was involved in that. And um, this ran for um, just over a year. Uh, they appraised it. They uh, thought that that meant it was a good idea. And they established a permanent scheme, which has been running uh, now for three years and is just about to be renewed um, as from uh, the end of this month. Uh, prior to that, they produced a report called Mediation and Clinical Claims. And we've given you the link to that uh, on our first slide. And this is, as far as I know, the first systematic look. It's not really an academic uh, review, but it's a practical review of uh, how the sponsors, if you like, of the uh, mediation scheme view uh, the way it's worked. 
and it's extremely positive and very encouraging. Um, and hence, um, they are satisfied in pushing on me with mediation uh, and, and renewing the contract. And we shall know soon who has been uh, appointed or reappointed to supply the panel. They have not themselves hired mediators. Uh, they place the contract for the provision of a mediation panel with independent bodies. And of course, you realize the importance of the neutrality and the independence of the mediators who work despite the fact that they are, of course, ultimately, in many cases, paid out of NHS funds, because uh, in most cases, that's the situation. But I think the striking thing about the whole setup in England is that uh, it has been driven, the development of mediation has been driven by those who mostly fund the litigation uh, of clinical claims. It, it, this has not been an initiative by either claimant or defendant lawyers. Indeed, I would go so far as to suggest they were probably both types of lawyer, and they're very distinct in this country, um, were pretty resistant to uh, instinctively using and growing the use of mediation. Uh, what happened was the NHS resolution piloted, decided it was a good thing, and they said to their probably slightly reluctant defendant lawyers, you are going to make this work. This is not going to be a performance indicator for you, uh, and, and you must use uh, the uh, tools you have available to persuade equally reluctant or possibly more reluctant claimant lawyers to join in mediations. And, and that has worked strikingly well. And, and now we have a cadre of, 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 of law firms and counsel who are very experienced at mediation, and we uh, find them uh, extremely good and very, very important players yeah. in the mediations that we conduct. We've been lucky also, just to f finish this slide, uh, that there have been, there been quite a lot of mobilization of, of plaintiffs here. An organization called ADMA, the Action for Victims of Medical Accidents, it was originally called, now it's Action Against Medical Accidents, uh, and, and an organization for personal injury lawyers. These have been mobilizing and organizing um, uh, plaintiff lawyers uh, to provide good service in this area, and though neither of them have swiftly embraced um, and, and, and as it were advocated mediation they are open to it and their members are certainly very open to it and that uh, and they have got and created specialist uh, lawyers who deal particularly with this kind of case so we have a good setup here uh, all based around now the fact that doctors are under a duty of candor they have got to, to disclose in law when things go wrong and 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 that is beginning to happen too, sadly too, that we have millions and billions of pounds, as it were, in notional reserve to meet claims of this kind. And the NHS is just as concerned to reduce that number and the cost of litigation as probably is true in South Africa. I wonder if it would be helpful to say, I think the slide has now uh, been moved from the screen. I wonder if it'd be helpful to say, Marion, I think you're going to circulate these slides afterwards to people, is that right? Okay, so. Yes, absolutely. So, um, and that question has come up on the chat function. Okay. We will okay. be making the slides available and the recording available on our website yeah. post, post yeah. this event. Just one aspect of the previous slide, the first slide that you just saw about the English context. Um, Tony talked about their defendant lawyers and the reason for that is that the way that NHS resolution operates is that they have criteria for selecting firms whom they regard as suitable uh, to act as defendant uh, advisors in this area of work. And so there is uh, a, a range of panel firms who are subject to selection and deselection. Yes. So that's how that works. That's why it's there. Uh, defendant lawyers. Hmm. Are we going to pause for questions at this stage or are we going to move on, do you think? Um, there have been no questions posted on the chat okay. function, so Fine. I think everyone's probably Thanks quite... Person. So quite let's move. To, ...to just hear what you have to say. Um, yeah, Fine. so if we could go ahead. So let's move on then to the next slide. And... The purpose really of this slide is to 
encourage all of you, whatever the context in which this is of interest to you, that any and all uh, issues, clinical uh, issues, clinical disputes can be mediated. So let's just have a look at the list in a little bit more detail. The quantum of damages, the third uh, point down, is probably um, familiar to most as a, a, an area in not just in clinical claims, but in any uh, litigation, a, an area for negotiation and therefore for settlement. However, as I say, all of these are available for, uh, uh, for mediated or other forms of dispute resolution. And indeed, Tony and I have both got uh, experience of mediating all of these issues on this list. So breach of duty, um, clearly that's, uh, uh, that's a, 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 it could be omission, something that somebody didn't do, as your example, Tony, a bit earlier, uh, commission, and yet uh, not necessarily, uh, in fact, very rarely in uh, our experience, is it a deliberate act. Ne I, would, I would almost go as far as to say never. Um, and, and it would include um, allegations of lack of informed consent. So really a, a wide range of breach of duty claims are mediated, are settled through mediation. Causation similarly. Um, of course, you're looking at uh, what would have happened, what would have happened anyway, what's the but for line, and that's particularly relevant in co where there are comorbidities, which there frequently are for people who've suffered um, uh, some kind of uh, clinical issue, which has caused them damage, uh, allegedly. Uh, quantum of damages, I don't think I need to move to that, except I suppose to say that in conversations in, uh, there have been questions raised quite frequently about, well, surely if the defendant is saying that the value of the case is zero and there is a significant claim, monetary claim, surely that gap is too big to mediate. Oh, no, it isn't. Um, we've, we've both mediated a wide range, actually, if you think about quantum, a wide range of cases I think for both of us, we've mediated cases in the 20 million plus arena. Um, so 20 million pounds, those tend to be birth injury cases, yes. generally speaking. Um, and we've both mediated cases where frankly, the damages are pretty small. Uh, they may be significant to the individuals concerned, or they may indeed, particularly in fatal cases where there is no dependency, there may indeed be very small numbers which make no sense whatever to somebody who has lost a loved one. And so the range of quantum claimed is very wide and the gaps are sometimes very large and can certainly be mediated to a satisfactory conclusion and satisfactory for both parties. Clearly no negotiation ever gets concluded unless both parties at some level feel that it's okay. Um, let me leave the multiple plaintiffs and defendants. I'm going to pass over to Tony uh, in a moment and uh, uh, I just want to pick up the, the high value and low value claims. I've said something about that already but both of those, there's no, there's no uh, reason why both of those shouldn't be uh, mediated. We can have the slide back. We'll probably cover the other two topics. Okay, before yes. you before we um, before we go on to cover those two topics, there are a couple of questions I'm just going to pepper in. Okay. Um, and if you could respond to them at some point, the first question Shirley is asking is: Is the litig is is the litig is the litigation done on a contingency basis mediation? And then Ross um, has asked the question: Is do you involve medical experts in clinical mediations? And if so, please explain the process. Um, I, think, I think I might leave you with both of those because I just want to pick up uh, a couple of other points from the slide and then I think I'll hand over. It's just nice to have two voices, I think. So then let me let, me let Tony, which one did you want to pick Well, up? I don't mind, I'll do both of them. Um, oh, well, do you okay. want to do those now? Yes, yeah, okay. do those now. Contingency basis. Um, the claimants, um, plaintiffs, sorry, solicitors in this jurisdiction almost always act on conditional fee agreements. Uh, so in other words, uh, uh, no win, no fee. 
uh, and uh, but, but we are paid, mediators do not operate on a contingency basis. We never base, operate on the basis of no, no settlement, no fee. That was uh, outlawed and absolutely rightly so from the very early yeah. stage in mediation. We get paid, I'm happy to say, in advance. <laughs> at least we, we earn our fee in advance, but we get paid in arrear. Uh, one can't be surprised about that when it's a lot of it's public money. But uh, we have no stake in the outcome. And it's really, really important that mediators should not have a stake in the outcome. In terms of experts, we, we will cover this a little bit more later on, but let me just say to, to cover the headline, um, I think in 20 years, I have once had an expert present at a mediation. What is present is their medical reports and what are their expert reports. And, and what we also have is all, almost invariably, I mean, I, for the purposes of today, invariably, um, lawyers who are expert in interpreting and arguing the points based on medical reports. Uh, and of course, there is discussion about these. Uh, we have a process uh, too, in a case which has gone on for some time and is approaching trial, where experts' reports have to be exchanged and the experts have to have a conversation to agree what they agree about and what they still disagree about. These are very useful uh, uh, if you happen to have a mediation running in a late stage. Uh, because it usually means that the issues have been narrowed uh, a, 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 and the lawyers can debate the gaps quite readily um, in order to try to feel their way towards an acceptable settlement. You, that doesn't happen. Uh, experts' reports are not ordinarily exchanged very often, except quotes without prejudice prior to the issue of proceedings. And it's fair to say that we do now find that mediations are happening before the issue of proceedings. And essentially what happens is people take a view on their expert. Uh, 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 they give us the reports in advance. We have a chance to understand the terminology. They, the expert reports often have learned articles attached to them. Lawyers in this country are used to arguing about the effect of learned articles very readily. And, 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 and there is a real live debate uh, between the parties. But the responsibility for that de debate lies with those who are representing each party. And it, it's a safe situation. Luckily, it's not me that has to, uh, as it were, say, you're right, you're wrong. And I think for those who deal with commercial disputes and are looking at, well, what's the difference here? There's a lot of similarities. I think one of the differences is the active use of uh, experts. Certainly in some commercial cases, it would be uh, helpful and usual to have financial experts present, to have uh, quantity surveyors, we call them here, so property experts present. Uh, not always, but in certain areas of commercial uh, work, you would expect that on a, I mean, as I say, I don't think, I've had, I've had doctors present oh, who yes. are in themselves experts, but they are not the expert witness at the trial, that's the difference. And occasionally parties do ring their expert during the yeah. course of a, a mediation to say, ah, that point we hadn't thought of, let's see what our expert makes of it. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, and of course they're not just medical experts, we have care experts, there is a lot of care evidence and their reports go on and on and on. We also have accommodation experts, we have uh, occupational therapy experts as well. But so there's a whole, there are a whole range and really, I think I've, been, I've had one care expert present in 20 years that's all yeah shall we come back to that again if there's no if there's still outstanding points later on because we've another slot where we might be talking about this and let me just talk a little bit now back on the slide <clears throat> in relation to um multiple multiple plaintiffs and multiple defendants um Certainly, you will have situations, I suspect, in South Africa where you have multiple dependents because you don't have crown indemnity or state indemnity in the same way as we have. But there are times, cases, where uh, you have a series of pieces of treatment where there, the claimant can't quite decide who is to blame, like the, the general practitioner, first yeah. of all. Set, I had one recently. G GP was the first port of call. Second port of call was a privately paid uh, consultant. Third port of call was an A and E doctor in an NHS where the pa patient turned up again because he hadn't been cured. So you will find cases of that kind where there is a certain amount of uh, mutual um, buck passing, if I call it that. Though on the whole, the uh, MDOs here, the medical defence organisations, and the NHS operate under memoranda of understanding. So there isn't too much of that because, of course, that kind of 
uh, into Nissan uh, litigation is extremely expensive. And, and, and one tries to, and, and, the, and the whole idea of Crown indemnity was to try to cut all of that out. Multiple plaintiffs, a, a different uh, situation. You may well have several claimants where a, um, uh, someone has uh, been injured or died and, and, a, pa and a parent uh, is claiming as a secondary victim for, um, for yeah. psychiatric damage as a result of that, it's ranging right up to big group actions. And some of you will have remembered uh, about the retained organs uh, situation here where pathologists were retaining indefinitely organs from children uh, taken after post-mortem without telling parents. Uh, the law has changed on that. Quite a lot of uh, that change was geared down to the fact that the dispute was mediated uh, with what something like 2,000 uh, claimants uh, and um, mainly one defendant uh, in the one that settled and, and, and a more complicated one after that. So um, it is possible to set it up in that way. And you have, um, in fatal cases, of course, you have an executor. Yes, of course. And then uh, just on right to or life and challenges always. over treatment. This is a, a, a developing area here. Um, I, I have done two of these cases where, in effect, the hospital was saying there's no more we can do for this child as it happens. And um, we think that all that we can offer is palliative care. And the parents object to that. You'll have heard probably the name of the case, Charlie Gard. It's not a mediation case, case I mediated. And it wasn't mediated. But the judge very notably said in that case, these kinds of cases should be mediated. And it's not so much that one necessarily expects them to settle, although the second one I did led to an agreement between hospital and family eventually, not on the day. Uh, it, it's the judges who have to, in a sense, take responsibility for maybe effectively ending the life of a child need to feel that no stone has been left unturned. Uh, and and the, the, a, a neutral like us has come in, sat down with the family, sat down with the hospital, um, facilitated conversations uh, as best they could possibly be facilitated, uh, got views exchanged just to make quite sure that there's no other option uh, uh, until the judge is asked to make that kind of sort of Damocles decision. So these are all the types of cases that are developing over here. And really, for anyone to say that can't be mediated, uh, 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 that kind of clinical dispute can't be mediated, is not so. There is ex example of every kind. And indeed, I'll add one more and mention it in a second, and that is cases where the defendants say, we are not liable. And, and we are coming to the mediation to try to persuade you to drop your case. Even that kind of case happens. And from time to time, plaintiffs go away and accept that they've got no case. But I'm going to come back to that a bit later on. And from time to time, defendants accept that they need to pay something in order to buy off the risk of Even the case. Even those kinds of cases. Yeah. Absolutely. So, needs of stakeholders. So, um, I want to link the needs of stakeholders to the to one of the items on the previous slide. I don't need the previous slide though. So, um, and that is the low value cases. There's something about and, and the families and patients who've, whose life has been changed very often so significantly as a result of the <coughs> um, alleged negligence. Um, there's something about a good drawing a close on the dispute, having a good ending and and one of the, if we look at the whole of this list, there are benefits and needs for each of these area, uh, groups of stakeholders. So patients and their families, I suppose, is the, is the focus. But I want to go to healthcare professionals, first of all, before we go into any detail on patients and their families and what their needs might be. One of the things that we've said to uh, many people moving into this area of work is, do not make the mistake as a mediator that you imagine or that you behave as though all the tears are in one room. They're not. There will be, uh, uh, as professionals, each of us can imagine the pain and the difficulty of being challenged in the way that a doctor or a nurse or another clinician is challenged if a dispute is brought against them. Uh, even if they have the protection of the hospital in an NHS hospital, mm. um, not all the tears are in one room, and I think that's an important thing for all of us to remember. And there are some benefits for uh, individuals who are involved in this 
to be able to participate in a process which, as Tony says, gives the opportunity for good conversations and for a degree of frankness which is perhaps not available outside of the safety of a mediation. There's, um, I, 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 I'm holding a book here so that I don't just have to learn this off by heart, but there's a list of needs which were identified, I think about 15 years ago. 2009, the book was written. 2009, okay. Okay, right. Shall we so say who the author was? Yes, let me tell you who the author was. It's Tamara, Tamara Relis. And uh, she's a, uh, a Canadian. And the book, the research was done in Canada. What is significant about it is that money is not at the top of the list of patients and their families' needs and wants from a mediation, from a mediated settlement. Now, I want to say that most cases end up with a payment being made and sometimes very significant figures being paid out by NHS resolution. Um, however, uh, the research that Tamara Relis did, and it's been supported by other research, uh, smaller research projects, I think, since, is that, and this won't come as a surprise to any of you who've ever heard um, an interview by people whose child has gone missing or who's uh, uh, some other member of the family has uh, suffered. They don't want it to happen to anyone else. That's top of the list for patient and their families. They want to have their say so that in some way their tragedy can benefit others. And that's so frequently heard by us and allowing some opportunity within a mediation for that aspect of their needs to be met is a very important part of the day for them. And uh, we will try to find out, actually, Tony, you're going to talk later about preparation, so yep. I won't say much about that now. But in advance of the mediation, we would try to find out what really matters, or at least some of what really matters to people, so that with their permission, we can pass over that information to the hospital, the healthcare professionals, so that they can think about is in what way can we meet those needs on the day? And some preparation for that is very important because you can't just pull ideas out of the air without any uh, opportunity to talk to colleagues in a much wider context sometimes. So uh, money is important and not only money. Um, feeling that there's been some opportunity for learning to be had, and I'm going to come on to that in a much wider context under the bullet point of others later on. Um, Never again, is it in Tamara's book, I've got the book here, uh, never again, answers, explanations, further information about what happened and why. Um, sometimes people want retribution, they want people sacked and so forth, struck off, struck off the register. That's not, that's not for the mediation. We're not uh, within the mediation dealing with regulators, although they, of course, are on the list of stakeholders in, in the wider context of clinical disputes. So um, some kind of acknowledgement as well that even though there's a dispute about the level of negligence, uh, perhaps, perhaps negligence is denied altogether even, but certainly uh, causation might be in dispute, uh, the, the level of care needed, so going to quantum, the level of care needed for future, all of these things which matter a lot to patients and their families may be in dispute but nevertheless some acknowledgement from people sitting at the table with them and listening carefully and taking seriously what life is like for them separate from was it your fault how much is it worth that is again an important part of the day and needs to be managed carefully planned for prepared for and handled well Going on to lawyers, um, I don't want to say too much about this, that, that, that a, a lawyer who brings, uh, whether it be a, a plaintiff or a defendant team, uh, client to mediation, it's part of the service that they're offering their clients. The opportunity within this context, if that's what, what the clients choose and if that's what they wish, the opportunity to have those conversations and to see whether settlement can be reached. Of course, you all know settlement, there's no obligation to settle at a mediation. 
and neither should there be. Uh, the other benefit for lawyers, I guess, is that you get paid quicker. <laughs> um, and and uh, I, I don't think that's a primary driver for most lawyers. The primary driver is to do the best for their clients. Uh, but it's a spin-off because uh, certainly with uh, settlement, which includes settlement on costs in most of the mediations that we're dealing with, uh, there are exceptions where costs have to be dealt with separately. But for the purposes of this, uh, the lawyers may well get the, the payment for the work done to date much more quickly than if this goes to trial in 18 months or two years time. And, and I suspect that 41A is going to make quite an impact on lawyers. I mean, the, the fact is they are going to have to satisfy the court that they have turned their mind to uh, the use of mediation uh, at a specific point, the, at the point of issue of proceedings, even if the mediation can't or doesn't happen at that stage and may have to be dealt with later. But they are going to have to get used to um, satisfying themselves. And, and this kind of background pressure, uh, which could lead to a, a cost sanction in theory at the end of the day, if they were acted unreasonably. And uh, I always congratulate South Africa on the Brownlee case, which is uh, actually has taken things further than in, in court decision terms than anything that we've had over here. Yeah, but uh, nevertheless, it's really uh, the, that kind of background pressure that the courts have imposed that has made, a, it, it's the tool, the lever that can be used to get people into mediation if necessary. But Actually, nowadays, I think the lever is less important. People are doing it. And the other needs of, of the lawyer stakeholders, of course, is to feel that they're going to be equipped to do the best job they possibly can, because every one of us as lawyers wants to offer a professional service. And if you've never been to a mediation, I often have a lawyer. Tony often has a lawyer on the phone. Uh, perhaps, perhaps actually less so, if I'm honest, in clinical cases now, because they tend to be spec uh, specialists but nevertheless I often have a lawyer saying well I've only done a couple of these mediations and part of my job part of your job as mediators is to provide them with whatever they need in order to feel equipped to do a good job on the day that's a benefit to their client it's a benefit to the process and it's a benefit to the other team to have well-equipped lawyers uh, participating in the in the process and it's a benefit to us well, it's helpful for because us, yes. The most, it has to be bottom of the list. The most important, <laughs> but the most important thing is it prevents us from being put into a position yeah. where we have to be advisors or adjudicators. That yeah. we, we are not doing that at any point during the mediations that we do. Uh, the lawyers are there to take responsibility for their own clients. We are there to offer and manage a process that makes it possible for them to get as much information available as they need to be able to give that advice. You've got mediators as specialists. Um, certainly, uh, both the providers who have been selected through the tender currently uh, uh, for NHS resolution as being suitable mediators, those providers have a panel of, they are the clinical negligence mediator specialists rather than necessarily clinicians, in fact, very, very few are clinicians in, in England, uh, or specialists, even specialist lawyers. There's, quite a range, but they are all specialists in mediating clinical cases. And that offers actually both the plaintiff and the defendant teams some comfort. Um, and of course, if you do one of these kinds of cases in a year, as opposed to 20 or 30 in a year, you're less well equipped as an individual mediator. And so uh, the providers uh, choose their panels, train their panels, keep an eye on their panels, get feedback, and I guess they may deselect from their panels as well uh, in certain, uh, pretty unusual, but nevertheless, certain cases. Let me just say a few things about others. Sorry, Heather, can I interrupt you? Sure. Um, there have been a, about 76% of the people on this, on this, um, on this meeting are, are accredited mediators, so you can understand that there are quite a few questions coming up at this okay. time yeah um so the the one question that that's been raised is um by gustav is is detailed knowledge of the law relating to medical malpractice necessary to act as a mediator in these cases and then another question that has been asked is do mediators necessarily need to be lawyers in your opinion or in the in the um context you're operating in 
I don't think I want to give an opinion on that. Um, I, I know uh, as a lawyer that it's very helpful to have some legal background. I also know because I was in business before I was a lawyer, rather a long time ago now, but nevertheless, I ran a small business. I worked in, a, in the oil industry and along the way, each of us who is working in a commercial context picks up a bit of law and that's very important and there's no reason why mediators should not develop sufficient knowledge of the law in order to be able to do what is necessary as a mediator equally you don't need to be a clinician but it's important and as i say there's there are issues in the in england about uh, overt neutrality uh, in terms of, of, of who's there uh, and in terms of clinicians acting as mediators. But leaving that aside, it's very important and any uh, lawyer dealing with a case of this kind needs to be able to pick up the, the, the language, to look at reports, to understand what they say and to be brave enough to say, look, I don't understand this bit. But in fact, you would, you would, uh, you would, you would pick up the medical reports and be able to read them perfectly adequately. Uh, and if you can't do that, then you're probably not going to be on the panel. Dare I mention? You could mention your book. Yes, we'll allow that. I could mention this, <laughs> which I can circulate, a book that I read called Mediating Clinical Claims, which tries to give, and I it's think it would probably be um, not an entirely irrelevant read to people in South Africa. Uh, CEDA does some, take some steps to kind of uh, train medias, medias up. We, we run a course called Law for Non-Lawyer Mediators uh, to give people a little bit of a familiarity about them. That's something that could very readily, I suspect, be uh, developed by Conflict Dynamics if there are a number of non-lawyer mediators who, who, who might appreciate just a sense of how the civil justice system works from, with a little bit more detail. Um, thinking of the, the, the in, in fact, the panel that CEDA has, um, most of us are lawyers. There is an ex-doctor, there is one or two barristers, um, and there are one or two ex-business people. Uh, yeah. So it's, it's a mixed bag. You do have to sort of, it, it's a question of being, carrying off the vocab, if you like, and, and having a sense of uh, where the pinch points might be, uh, but being honest enough to be able to say to a lawyer, look, I don't understand that point, or you know, can, can you explain that to me, what the consequences are if you don't do that? But I think, I guess, one can't escape from the fact that a, a certain amount of familiarity with pro, pr procedure uh, and, yes. and an understanding of the law is. But the great thing is, we are not decision makers. Uh, at the end of the day, we are facilitating a process in which those who are lawyers can have a, a, a real good discussion about who's right and who's wrong and who's going to win and who is not going to win and what the chances of either of those not happening really is. Uh, and they're not coming to us to say, this is what the medical position is or this is what happens if it goes to the judge. We are simply not doing that. And I think it's one of the, that's why lawyers are so really, really important. Good lawyers representing each party are really, really important in this kind of sphere. I agree. So I'm, I'm not sure we've answered the question fully because there isn't a full answer, I guess. It's, it depends. Um, the, the, the quick answer is you do not have to be a lawyer to be a, a, a clinical negligence mediator. You do not have to be a doctor to be a clinical negligence mediator. Some facility with both of those arenas is, of course, important. Yeah, thank you. I think that that does give us um, some sense. Um, <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to, before we move on to to uh, looking at, we're going to look at uh, a kind of familiar day uh, shortly, but I just want to look at others because in that list you've got healthcare providers and that's a wide range uh, from large hospitals, cottage hospitals, clinics, individual individuals who uh, in, in all of those areas, some of them are doctors, some other kinds of um, uh, therapy providers. Regulators, of course, there's the GMC, uh, the General Medical Council here, there's the Midwifery, Nursing and Midwifery Council, there are regulators and, 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 uh, and there's, there's government. And government uh, wants a good health service and wants a safe uh, health service. And society as a whole, Society as a whole wants a whole range of things. 
Um, and I think the most important thing that can emerge from clinical mediations, and particularly the way that NHS resolution is handling the feedback, both from the cases and from the mediations, the most important thing is the learning and the learning that is gained by individual hospitals and clinical groups, but also the learning that's disseminated. Because one of the things that NHS resolution has developed since the pilot in 2014 is a learning and safety and learning safety, arm. Safety, safety and, and learning, learning arm. And there they collect data, I believe anonymously. I mean, we are not privy to all of the, the work of that group, but it's not, I've certainly had on several occasions, not only uh, the case handler for NHS resolution, who is the person who holds the purse strings in uh, NHS cases, but also I've had somebody from the safety and learning uh, group of NHS resolution who are taking away learning, uh, which they're then going to disseminate to, uh, I believe, to all hospital trusts trust, yes. linked to the NHS in the UK, in, uh, in England. And I found it very comforting for uh, claimants to be able, plaintiffs, to be able to say to families, uh, 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 and this is one of the things that NHS yeah. resolution does, this is not just a question of uh, material being fed back to the trust that is in the frame. Actually, if there's learning that is nationwide of value, it's going to go nationwide. And I've seen some of the spreadsheets that they produced uh, of, of information uh, about where the pinch points are and where th things need to be better. And, the, and NHS resolution themselves have produced things like stick injury uh, advises and, yeah. and very concerned too, particularly about birth injury cases. Of course. I mean, government and society, I, I, I'm just ch checking the figure because I could hardly believe it. Um, I just looked at the last report of the NHS resolution and their provision for damages known about in claims known about and future claims estimated. Sit down, everyone. Eighty three billion pounds. That is an awful lot of money. I suspect that there are quite a number of uh, members of the United Nations who have a smaller GDP than that. Yes. And <laughs> it's a horrendous figure. And, and, and I said, you know, from what I hear from South Africa, you had the same financial challenges in relation to the, the, the possible bill for, uh, for clinical negligence there. And so it's got to be tackled in some way. And, and, and certainly the, uh, the health committee in, 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 in the House of Commons has been nagging NHS resolution to show how they are reducing the, the huge figures, both of damages and costs that they're shelling out for these claims. Um, just a question, another question, um, Heather, before you finish that, that last slide. Would medical insurance providers and indemnifiers be included in your other's um, um, point there? Uh, uh, yes, they, well, yes, they would. And they would be, I put my slide to one side now. Yes, yes, I'm sure, yes, yes they would be. Certainly. Yes. Okay, and then you have just a again, proportion of the market in the hands of medi in, in the hands of, in, of indemnifiers in South Africa than we do here. Well, well I don't know. Okay. I mean, now NHS has taken over GP uh, NHS work, NHS resolution, so they, they only deal with private medicine. And I think on the first slide, we've included those as med medical defence organisations. Okay, yep. uh, we've right. included those as in, in the kind of defendant bundle, if you like. Yeah. Um, you're quite right. That's not on that slide, and I'm. Um, quite sure that slide's not uh, uh, exhaustive, mm. but it gives a feel for the numbers of people, organizations and society as a whole for whom this is important. Mm. Mm. No, thank you for that. The, just Sorry. one other question, one other question coming from on that slide specifically, which, which we haven't addressed fully, um, is just the, the motivation of the, um, of what people are requesting. So, so the ah, question yes. here is, is whether claimant's motivation um, is about the money or treatment. Um, you did speak to, speak to it a bit, but there seem yeah. to be a couple of our-, our Well, there'll be, there'll be a, there'll be a I can talk about it too in the, in, in the, uh, in the context of the next stage of what we wanted to run through, what we're going to do, I'll tell you, just so you know, okay. the next three or four slides are taking you through a typical mediation of a clinical case with the kind of considerations that we bring to how to design the process and run it in, in, in a moment. I, I think there are mixed 
motivations, quite often, uh, and I'm thinking of a case I did last week, the only way the claimant could find to catch, feel that they caught the attention of the NHS was by bringing proceedings. They had used the complaints procedure, which had been unsatisfactory. Uh, they had written letters and complained to this, that, and the other. Nothing had happened. And they, so they said, look, our, all we could do was to you know, bring proceedings. And, and that has caught their attention. I think this is improving now, but certainly that was very typical of the situation some time ago. Oh, yeah. and, to, and, and to be honest, our complaint system is still, in a, frankly, I, I believe, in a mess because it's, uh, it, 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 it is run trust to trust. Um, the people who run it um, are of very variable quality. Uh, and I've seen time and again uh, instances of people saying, well, we had a meeting and it was useless uh, and so on. So, I mean, part of the solution of all of this is dealing with complaints better in the first place. And I think having in, in serious complaints, actually having a structure whereby you could have someone like a mediator coming in and running the process to make it look fair. But, it, mm. but, it, but if a claimant is invited to a meeting at the hospital they're complaining of, with a meeting with a doctor, which is run by someone who is a, a, a promoted nurse who is running the complaint system, um, you know, it, it very readily looks wrong. And how one can hope that that sort of system can be uh, de deliver satisfaction, it, it, well, people would have to be very generous if they were complainants and families. Uh, to feel satisfied by that kind of thing. And one of the things that we quite often hear is somebody will say towards the end of a day, which is in, whether it's been finalised or whether it's been productive in some other way, will often say to Tony or to me or to any other clinical mediator, clinical negligence mediator, I don't know why we didn't sit down four years ago and have these conversations. Absolutely. And of course, as a lawyer, as a clinician, perhaps, uh, as, as a, a mediator, we actually know some of the reasons why it's taken a bit longer than a, a, an ordinary member of the public might imagine. But nevertheless, um, there are probably, there are certainly improvements here that we could make on that and that possibly in your context too. I've even heard the mm. doctor say, if we had done this yes. better, we would not have been here and your wife would be sitting next to you now. I mean, you oh, know, mo word. moments like that really, yeah. which are the things that, the, the moments that mediation creates, which are so utterly worthwhile. Shall we run through this, um, a, a quick um, thumbnail of the of, of a mediation day, and we'll be picking up some of these points as we go. Let's get the four first. Yeah, so the, the four we're going to have, are firstly preparation, then uh, I'm going to deal with that. Heather's going to deal with opening, I'm going to deal with the exploration. These are some of the phrases that come from Conflict Dynamics CEDA um, mediation model, uh, and, and we put them in inverted commas uh, mostly because uh, we want you to jargon. feel that they are jargon and we're trying to get behind the jargon. So preparation of the day. Mm. Well, we are selected, I guess, and more and more lawyers actually rec say we'd like to have this particular mediator. I, mean, I find I get sometimes direct uh, appointments, even though the case is actually managed through CEDA, uh, which helps me, but also you know, it's nice for CEDA to have someone cutting the corner and getting the mediator sorted. But there's a panel and people can choose from the panel. Before, when I get that instruction, I will always make telephone contact with the lawyers. And with them, I will always offer to speak to their client, their lay client, anyone who hasn't been to a mediation before the day, to settle them down about the process. People are often very nervous about engaging, even in a mediation, with, with, with all its flexibility and informality. And so calming them down and reassuring them they're not going to be cross-examined or giving evidence on oath or going to be uh, anything uncomfortable and that the process will be designed entirely to meet their needs and will, they'll have plenty of preparation before anything happens that they aren't, aren't expecting and will all be clear. These are all things to talk through with them in advance. And some, if there were a doctor coming who was equally concerned, I would want that conversation with them. I have to admit that um, doctors are not regular attend, defendant clinicians are not regular attenders at mediations. We don't often get them. We usually get someone from the trust. And I'm hoping, firstly, that Zoom and such techniques will make it more possible for them to come for some of the time. And I'm hoping too, if, if doctors start to mobilize themselves, they will see the value of coming to shed their tears as well uh, at the mediation and maybe to be forgiven. Um, 
it, I, it's not a phrase I would ever want to use, but there's certainly, I've seen doctors being forgiven by someone at a mediation, and that's a very moving thing to experience. But also we are in effect doing some of that exploration even now in these pre preliminary conversations with lawyers and partners. We're looking to see what value the claimants particularly or either party might want to seek to derive out of the mediation because the value is not just in the outcomes it's also in the conversations that take place and people to be able to hear an apology you'd be amazed how often an apology even delivered second or third hand by the someone long way down lawyer even says we're really sorry that this happened that the trust is really sorry I've heard people say, well, thank you very much. It's some, and quite often they say, well, that's the first time I've heard yeah. that in the three or four years. Yeah. So getting that said is, and, and, and planning for that in advance and seeing how far a trust is prepared to go in saying that kind of thing, maybe following it up with a letter from the chief executive, this is all part of the planning for the occasion. It also goes to who should attend. I've talked about, I'm hoping to get doctors there more often in the future because I think that's important. Documentation. Well, um, uh, you don't need the medical notes. <laughs> you <laughs> can't not, read them anyway. <laughs> you probably can't read them anyway. Uh, doctors among you will now be squirming about your handwriting uh, abilities. Um, uh, but um, what I need essentially is to know what the issues are, which may be in a letter before the action, because of course we have pre-action protocols that require a proper letter, argued letter to be given by the claimant and a proper answer from the defence. I'd want those two, or if it was issued proceedings, I'd want to have the court papers, the pleadings. I'd want to have uh, the expert reports that each side is relying upon, and I'd want to have a schedule of loss and a counter schedule. Those are the basic documents that you need. And because we're not doing what a judge does, going line by line over the evidence, line by line over the experts' reports, and deciding who's right and who's wrong, we're not decision makers, thank God. Uh, the uh, parties who are deciding are the lawyers in the advice they give, and if they can't agree, the judge is the person who will decide for them. So the documentation is relatively straightforward and, and, not, and doesn't have to be over complex. Venue arrangements, well, we're used to having mediations in <coughs> lawyers' offices now. We don't very often get the, the neutral venues. Occasionally, you see that how hosts a mediation or the, the premises they're in. Um, but we're used to having them in councils, chambers, or, or, or lawyers' offices. Never in hospitals. Never in hospitals. Absolutely right. And I've talked to really about non-financial benefits and outcomes because it's important that you ask whether people need these or wanting these things, the kind of things that Heather talked about in the Tamara Reddis book, and, and, and because they have to be planned for. Mm. Uh, uh, and sometimes they can't be de delivered at the mediation, uh, and sometimes they only bubble up at the mediation. But even so, what I want to do is to create a situation in which the claimant believes that the defendant team, however it's constituted, uh, are a conduit to the trust that's in the frame and will take messages back and will make further arrangements later. Then finally, no offer cases. There are cases where the defendants say, we do, we're terribly sorry that this all went wrong on our watch, but we do not think we're legally liable. Uh, and we, what we're doing is coming to persuade you that if we possibly can. It's really, really important that gets set up in advance. Um, some claimants will huff off and say, well, if that's all you're coming, then we're not going to have a mediation. And that's down to them if that's the attitude they take. Sometimes, uh, I think more often than not, probably, they say, well, we think we are going to come because we do think we've got a case. And the defendants have to say and should say, and they're thinking, we are here to listen. We are we persuade us if we're wrong and and i've certainly had cases where they've come intending to make no offer so so they said and they changed their minds but you do have to prepare the ground for that kind of eventuality carefully and and because the last thing in the world you want is arrive at the mediation the first thing the defendants say without any warning is well of course we think you've got a rubbish case and we're not actually going to be putting any money on the table you do if, if there's any whiff of that in your preparation you need to say be open about that and, 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 and underline that you're prepared to listen. Just wanted to, to, to I've written down when, I was just scribbling a oh, note yes, here. Um, uh, many of you will know this, but just so very briefly, mediations can take place and can success, successfully uh, enable the parties to find a resolution, whether they are, whether they are pre-issue 
So before uh, before issues have been uh, before proceedings have been issued, uh, post issue, and even really quite close to trial. Uh, clearly, there are differences in those uh, uh, three stages, both in terms of expenditure and therefore some of the the benefit, which is cost saving uh, uh, for for particularly for defendant parties. Um, but also um, in terms of what you have to live with in terms of information. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, I think increasingly um, we are seeing we are seeing cases come pre-issue, come to mediation pre-issue with both parties satisfied that they can live with uh, the amount of information that's available currently. Uh, some of that will still be confidential, so they might have an, a medical report that hasn't been. Um, exchanged and, and it's up to them how much if any of that they uh, convey either by uh, actually exchange, exchange of documentation or by conversation mm -hmm. on the day so pre-issue post-issue close to trial you can do any or all of those yeah absolutely uh, it's a brave and experienced lawyer who can say to a client pre-issue i think this is worth seriously considering yeah. uh, 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 and, and this goes to the where money actually lives in the scheme of things Clearly, if you have someone who's seriously disabled and needs lots of money for care in the future, the money absolutely matters. But the money almost takes on the symbolic um, yeah. um, nature uh, in the course of conversations. And if other things have been delivered, like an apology and, and particularly the lessons are shown to have been learned and, and, and therefore what happened is a sort of a, a memorial to whoever suffered the damage because it's less likely to happen to someone else. The money, in a sense, is, a, is another kind of acknowledgement without actually needing or being felt by the claimant. Even if a lawyer says you could get more at trial, the claimant might well say that'll do. Uh, I, I'd rather a bird in the hand is one phrase that crops up occasionally, uh, you know, and, and, and because they, they just feel that they want to get it over and done with, they'd rather take what's on offer now. Uh, 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 and, and settle for what for what's happened. So opening the day, Heather, over to you on this one. So preparation for the day, and it's become increasingly important actually over um, the, the 20 or so years that I and Tony have been mediating. Um, preparation has become uh, the foundation for uh, yeah. effective, productive day. So. What happens when you actually get there? And we're talking at the moment, and that's because most clinical cases are convened for a day and are concluded in a day. So for those of you who work in other arenas where it's normal and useful to spread over several weeks or months, uh, forgive us. We're talking about a day because that's our norm in these kinds of cases. So preliminary meetings, uh, we, do, we think, uh, so I'm going to the third bullet point, we believe that sitting around the table, even for a short period of time, even where certain members of teams do not speak, but where introductions are done and the tone of the day is set, uh, we believe that that's important. What is also important, going back to the first bullet point, is that you don't rush people into that. In a way, some of this is not different from other mediations, where sensitive issues are being discussed, where people have fallen out in a serious way, whether commercially or personally. But the preliminary meetings are very important uh, in this case because of the acknowledgement that the mediator needs to give to people they have probably only spoken to over the phone about how tough this has been. And that again, as I said earlier, is in both rooms. Uh, and so the settling in process and the discussing process is really important. One of the things that I have started to do in the last couple of years is always to say that anybody in either team can take a break at any time without giving a reason yeah. Yeah. and i started to do that only a couple of years ago <clears throat> clearly i would have made that available but i do that now absolutely deliberately in each room and the reason is particularly in plaintiff rooms there is often somebody who needs um perhaps to uh perhaps to change an incontinence pad very regularly, but actually doesn't want to tell everybody that that's what they're going to be doing. Perhaps somebody feels uh, uncertain, having never been to a mediation before in the defendant team, and actually wants a quick word with their lawyer before 
they launch into, albeit a, an apology that has been prepared. And so uh, for all kinds of reasons, people may want a bit of time out and to make that available is a very important part of these days because I think because of the context, the context of grief, of loss, of damage regardless of who's right and who's wrong and whether it's negligent or not negligent. Um, one of the things that we need to do as mediators, as you well know, is to establish a safe environment. And in this context, I think probably taking that, uh, allowing that break, overtly allowing those breaks is part of establishing a safe environment. Yeah. The mediation agreement also mm -hmm. establishes a safe environment in a very similar way to most other mediations. Uh, the the tone that's set creates a, a sense of safety. Um, and sometimes, uh, particularly in plaintiff teams, uh, but sometimes in defendant teams as well, there are individuals who are reluctant to come into a joint meeting. So the preliminary meeting and creating the safe environment has to happen in that preliminary meeting as well as to be uh, re-established and maintained through the joint meeting. It's unusual for i think for either of us to have a mediation where the parties never meet it's not impossible and sometimes that's needed in order to uh, make progress uh, but it's unusual because uh, usually we're able to persuade people that the meeting will be safe that we will handle it well enough for them to be comfortable enough to sit there for a short period of time to uh, there are introductions around the table. There are real benefits in putting a name to a face and a face to a name. Because if you imagine this taking place in a law firm's offices with three rooms, uh, people are going to cross paths during the day. They may not know whether the person that they're walking past in the corridor is from the other room in the mediation or from another part of the law firm. But it's usually more comfortable if you have a sense of who's here and therefore uh, a sense of whom you might meet either in formal meetings or informally in corridors. Can I say something about power imbalance in yeah, relation to this? Because um, people sometimes say, well, how on earth can you redress a sense of imbalance between an individual claimant and a large institution? Um, and they try to say, well, mediation is no good at that. And I, I say quite the opposite. I think that when a, a team of two or three people, four people uh, for the claimant side come into a, and sit around a table with a, a team of a similar number of the defendant side, that actually redresses the balance. They see that the people on the other side are fairly normal human beings. They talk uh, like that. They talk to them. They use first names. Occasionally, we all smile, uh, even if it's a really sad case. And, 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 and they, they really buy into the fact that this is a genuine conversation between the people that they can see, which is why this joint meeting is so important. So a couple more things on this and then uh, we'll move on to the, 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 the central part of the day. So who speaks in what order? I know from the commercial cases that I still do uh, that it's very usual for the uh, plaintiff to begin and then for the defendant to respond. In these cases, that has to be worked out a bit more carefully because sometimes the, the defendant will say, we'd really like to make an apology at the beginning. So then you'd need to negotiate that as part of the, as part of the preliminary meeting with the plaintiff. Are they willing to allow the defendant, you, you, with their permission, you'd say the defendants would like to say a few words to you, they'd like to make an apology, whatever you've got permission to say, and you get permission on that. So that's a little bit more complicated than in my experience than in most commercial cases. Um, and there is no rule about what you have to do, but what seems to work well at, as an opening uh, is to brief the parties that there will be definitely no figures discussed at the opening meeting and that we're probably going to do broad brush, uh, uh, use a broad brush approach at this stage and pick up detail later. So what usually happens is preliminary meetings where people feel ready to sit around the table together, a relatively short meeting sitting around the table together, and then a break for a bit of catch up in both rooms, and then bringing often just the legal teams together uh, to have a, a more in-depth conversation about the medico-legal issues. And that's 
That's not a rule. That's not what I always do. It's not what Tony always does, but it seems to be emerging as a, a, as a, a useful way of running quite a lot of these mediations. It's up to the claimant whether they come in with their for the medical and legal issues, and sometimes yeah, they'll be robust they enough to do that. Yeah. But if you're going to be talking about reduced life expectancy or what would have happened to someone in any event because of the condition that they presented yeah. with and how uh, and what the consequences of that would have been, you can see that there may be conversations about the medical legal issues that they would prefer not to be. And usually claimants are careful about that. Yeah. So we then go on to talk about expiration. We're, we're, can we're I, moving, can I we're just moving quite a... fast here because of the time. Um, yes, I, and I'm concerned about the time. Um, just a question that will lead into the next phase, which is kind of the exploration phase, okay. um, and maybe short circuit it so that we can yep. have some time at the end for questions. Is just how much time do you spend getting into the, um, let's call it the, the the detail of the of the issues um, during those initial meetings? as opposed to later in exploration? Not much at all. Um, in, in most cases, in the preliminary meetings, we're simply talking about process. We're, de we're deciding, we're getting people to decide who's going to go first. We're, get, we're reassuring people about what is and isn't going to happen in the joint meeting, who is there. Uh, and and, and we're, we're rarely talking about, uh, you know, what's happening uh, in, in terms of the, the issue. Sometimes we do with the defendant team, but m m more so with them probably than with the plaintiff team. But um, in, a, in a way, I want the plaintiff and defendant team to choose how they want to present those issues at either the first meeting or more likely the, the, the later joint meeting between lawyers, because I'd like them to feel that they can be conciliatory rather than confrontational. I mean, most position papers prior to mediations are pretty much as positional as the name implies and 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 congruent with their on the record pleaded case sometimes you get well but we are coming in good faith to have a chat kind of thing but mm. um uh, I, I i don't want too much to influence how they choose to present it i might say look don't forget you're in a mediation and that you might be able to make some concessionary noises i might say that but that, i must leave it to them to choose Okay. Should I go on to Sorry, so we have 15 Great. minutes left. So okay, well, we'll just we'll rattle through as fast as we can. Expiration. Um, I, I, there's a, a lot on the slide. Actually. There's a lot on the slide, which we can leave you with. And if you just have a look at it there. Um, in, in a way, we've talked about all of these things. Um, and and uh, it's um, what we're really, I, I think I can do it overall by saying what the aim of this bit is for everyone to be honest about the weaknesses in their case. If parties are not honest in private, usually not even with the mediator, about where their chances of not succeeding, they are not be likely to find a kind of compromise basis which they can unite around in order to settle the case. And that's what happens. And one has to normalize in conversations with people because each of these lawyers will put a, a, a brilliant top end case on, on you know, in, in, in somewhere in their schedule. Uh, and they will each be having conversations internally, which say, well, I know we said your claim was worth 1 million, but it's really worth considering this settlement offer around about 450,000 for this or that reason. And these are conversations that are quite tricky for people to have. I mean, you know, face is involved in both rooms. Or the defendants, we said you've got a wonderful case to fight. It now sounds a little bit less likely. Look at that claimant. Do you want that person in the witness box? Uh, uh, and we're fighting, you know, shooting you down in flames. So these are the kinds of things that exploration is actually about. And, and we have to bring our skills and experience as process managers to deciding, suggesting how it might best be done. And it may be a shuttle, it may be further joint meetings, it may be even, not just between lawyers. I've had, had many meetings between hospital representative and plaintiff family, just without lawyers. And these have been hugely important for dealing with issues like um, lessons learned. And, and, and so all of these ways, you, there's no way you can possibly generalize about it, but you just have to remember the, the three or four different tools you've got in the box to, to bring things. Sometimes it means intercepting lead counsel on his way to the loo and saying, look, I'm really worried about this or that. What, what should we do about it? We have to use all the, all the subtleties and, the, you know, <laughs> <laughs> experience we have to find ways to let people get forward.
I think that's all I need to say about exploration now. And um, if you leave the slide there for a moment, because I'm going to link that with um, the bargaining and concluding. Again, we've put these in inverted commas. This is jargon that uh, Conflict Dynamics and CEDA uses when, when training mediators. But, but this, uh, the slide is inevitably linear. The previous slide is inevitable. All of them are linear. The process is not linear. And so uh, what, just thinking about if I look at generating broad ideas for settlement, that might actually have happened in the preparation telephone course. Yes. And the reason that has to happen is that the hospital has to be able to come and say, well, these are the 10 things that we've changed since uh, this uh, occurrence three or four years ago where we've changed the nursing regime or we've changed the this or the that. So some of these things are not done even in what might be a third stage. Yeah. A bit of the exploration is done in preparation, a bit of the exploration is done in broad brush around the table, and a bit of the exploration may be done sure. here. So what that does, that, what does, that does indicate is that quite extensive conversations will happen in those pre-mediation conversations yes. before. Yes. Yes. Um, in the preparation telephone conversations yes, before absolutely. the action event. Yes. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, and so if we can now go on to the next slide and I'll link this again. So Even the last slide. The last slide. The last slide. Yes, this is, it's always important to give good news when you can. <laughs> the last slide. Good media to practice. Okay, so bargaining and concluding. I think we've talked about money as yeah. a driver. Is it, isn't it? Uh, sometimes it has to be. Sometimes it is because that has greater symbolism than other things. And sometimes, although of course, in terms of the litigation, the schedule indicates that money is the, well, money is probably the only remedy actually through the litigation. It really isn't the primary driver, perhaps. Uh, it's only part of the picture for the uh, plaintiffs. Uh, revisiting party risk analysis. This is really what happens. And sometimes the mediator takes a full uh, conversational part in that. A lot of that is, uh, a, a more, some of that is certainly done without the mediator present. Mm -hmm. Parties having conversations amongst their teams. And that's an ongoing process throughout the day. Um, how much do mediators participate? You've heard this before from mediators, it depends. So <laughs> is money a driver? It depends. How much the mediators participate it depends who bids first it depends there's a bit of a um there's a a bit of a pattern emerging that de that defendants tend to bid first uh unless but not the if there's a, a tender unless, the unless they've made, made a tender a, unless they've made a uh, what we call a part 36 uh, you, offer, call a tender. you call a tender they might say well the plaintiff should now tell us how they respond to that exactly tender. yeah, yeah. Um, how the mediator adds value at this stage, lots of different ways. Um, and again, not very different from all mediations. They add value by providing the environment in which difficult conversations can take place, by acting as a sounding board in individual rooms and doing a bit of coaching about how might you convey that, um, or how might you ask me to convey that. Um, they also, they participate actually in discussion about numbers as well, but without we would say ever saying this is what you've got to this is what you've got to settle for because this is what the judge will 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 bring to the uh, uh, the litigation if it goes to court. We would say that was below uh, a cutoff line, but I might well say Tony might well say, you know, I think you're going to have to move into six figures if this is going to get sorted. Oh yeah, that would be that would be quite a gentle uh, challenge in the early stages of bargaining. Um, I want to say, yeah, I just want to refer back to needs because some of these needs that we were talking about earlier, so apology, um, uh, lessons learned, et cetera, et cetera, a long list, uh, further explanation, some of that will be documented in the settlement agreement. Uh, some of it, some of it will not be documented. It'll be taken on trust or it'll be an email from one solicitor to another saying that letter will be with you by Thursday week. Um, so documenting the settlement is uh, actually it's usually quicker than in a lot of commercial cases. Those of you who've done shareholder disputes, inheritance disputes, there's a lot of, uh, of detail in that. And indeed, if any kind of conveyancing is, is involved, 
you, you almost certainly can't do that as part of a documented signed settlement on the day. You can do it as heads of agreement, but not as, whereas we normally end up with settlement having been reached because the, the settlement figures are, are, are high uh, and normally the settlement documents are signed on the usually day. Usually one page. Exactly. In this, yeah. this kind of case, it's usually one page. Unsettled cases and discontinuance, you keep going, you're a mediator, so don't give up. And discontinuance of a claim, you dealt with that earlier, Tony. Um, sometimes uh, plaintiffs uh, do accept that they come to listen to, uh, to talk to the defendant, to try to persuade them. Sometimes they are uh, the, the negotiated outcome is a discontinuance of the claim. Very rarely on the day, but I mean, yeah. for instance, I had a case where it yeah. was quite plain that the defendants frankly, hold the claimant's expert under the waterline at the mediation and quoted occasions when this expert had not been accepted by judges and so on. Two weeks later, a notice of discontinuance was filed. And I think the final thing to say is that just going back to the shape of this, um, we've given you an idea of it, but I've, I've written myself a note here that very often, not, well, let me not overstate it, often, when you go, you have a um, settling in meeting, a joint meeting, a break for parties to catch up in their, in their teams, and then you have a, a medical legal discussion. Sometimes that's detail about the medical legal issues. Sometimes the parties both say, we've had enough correspondence on this. We both know what we think. You've seen all the, doc you've see we've seen all the medical uh, reports. Uh, you've seen even the the joint statement from the from the joint expert or from the two experts offering the quarter joint statement. Um, we're actually ready to go to look at the schedule now. So you move into what looks like bargaining really pretty early in terms of talking through the schedule, looking at where they agree, where they don't agree, and then they may need to come back to well, this is this is a real sticking point. Let's talk about that medical report. Let's talk about uh, that legal issue. A bit in a bit more detail later on so you've got flexibility of course well i'm afraid we've taken up most of your time <laughs> but let's pause and see if there's time for a question or two um good so on the chat function we seem to have um slowed down on the question fronts there is <laughs> still a little there's Overload. Still a little uncertainty of um your role as a mediator and how how to what extent you engage with the expert reports. Um, well, can you give us any... Okay, I'll tell you a bit more about that. that. I, I really think everyone needs to go into a clinical mediation thinking of themselves as a process manager. Uh, but we will uh, do a bit of reality testing as well. Uh, we, we might say, if it's clear that there's a dispute between... For instance, this case where the defendants own expert and the defendant team thought the claimant's expert was actually unsound. Um, I, I didn't cross-examine the plaintiff's solicitors about that, but what I did say was, I think, um, it's fairly plain the defendants take a very robust view about your expert and they tell me they're greatly looking forward to uh, the cross-examination in the witness box of your expert. Um, you'll have to decide um, whether it's someone you want to stick up to, 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 to fight the case for you. Um, it, it really, I, I just want to reassure you that uh, uh, we, we do not often find ourselves having to engage in detail with experts' views. That's what the lawyer's job is to do. And, and that's why we have medico-legal meetings at which the lawyers and, and quite often this is counsel as well as solicitor here, as it would be with you, and, and, and counsel are very, very good at this. I mean, they plunge into the supporting um, academic published papers, peer-reviewed papers that support the cases that, the, that cases. The, ex the, the expert has actually added to his expert witness, and they will debate them because that's what they're going to have to do at the trial. Um, but luckily, um, I don't have to decide who is right and which experts right or wrong. They do. And they have to decide not at the level of who is right and who is wrong. They have to decide what difference does this make to my risk assessment of this case? Does this mean to say that I cease trying to hope that I'm going to win this case hands down 100 percent, whether I'm a plaintiff or a defendant? Or does it mean that it would be sensible for me to try and find something in the middle that I can live with and that I can advise my client to live with? And if 
they're honest about the risks and the downsides, as I said earlier on, about the chances of not winning, that's when outcomes will emerge that people find acceptable. And just to add to that, there's also a commercial imperative for defendants, because if they're going to spend, let me pick figures out of the air, they're going to spend 100,000 whatever's going to trial and they can buy it off for 50 today, then... I mean, that sounds that sounds very kind of cool and calculating. And of course, you wouldn't put it in that way. But there is also a commercial reality to this, that there are costs involved and that it makes sense perhaps for both teams to look at that in, in terms of um, setting aside, yeah. even setting aside. And particularly, I think, in pre-issue, yeah. you're, you're often looking at that as a primary driver. Well, in, in England, to issue a claim for more than £250,000, you have to pay a court fee of £10,000. Ten thousand pounds and that has to be found from somewhere unless someone is indigent, indigent and can get an exemption and also here rather differently i think from you um defendants can rarely recover their costs even if they win i suspect you can still the defendants in south africa can still yeah, if difference. you if you defeat a claim you've probably got some chance of getting some money uh, out of the claimant but if, if they happen to have any but, you know, so there are various other drivers yeah. that, as Heather says, might, might encourage a defendant to make an offer which otherwise they might not be inclined to make. Yeah, okay. Um, there are two other questions that have come up. Um, we are cutting into, well, we're, we've finished our, our time, our, our 90 minute slot that we've set aside. But these are interesting questions about the difference between this context and the context you're operating in, um, Tony and Heather. Um, the first question Felicity is asking is that the system here in South Africa that's been piloted um, is that there's a co-mediation arrangement um, and often um, one of the mediators has a legal background, the other has a um, clinical background. Um, what do you think of that um, arrangement? No, why don't I know? Um, it sounds expensive. <laughs> is what I think. Um, so I don't know that that would run here at all, because if both mediators are expecting to be paid, um, mm. it depends what the role is. And it goes back, I suppose, to the questions earlier about, you know, what's, do you have to be a lawyer? Do you have to be a doctor? If you, if you are a lawyer, if you are a doctor, and if you bring that professional expertise into the room, then there are real risks, um, is what I would say. Um, uh, so co-mediation, I have nothing against it in principle, but I don't see it being paid for. And it doesn't happen here. It doesn't happen here. I mean, occasionally we have observers who are mediators who are kind of trying to get their clinical negligence ticket. But, but uh, as I say, it, we are not adjudicators. We don't actually have to decide. Uh, we need to inform ourselves. And actually with Google, uh, okay, I, I wouldn't want to do an operation based on what I read on Google, <laughs> but I think I could probably understand the operation uh, after all these years, and maybe that's just lucky that I've been dealing with medical legal matters now for 50 years um, in, in one respect or other. But um, I don't have to decide. That's what the judge does. Well, for me, it's six years, and I can also <laughs> Google it and get a rough idea of what's supposed to be <laughs> Um, just an, just another 50 question. years for me for obvious reasons. <laughs> yeah. also, absolutely. Um, another question, and um, Herman Edelin, um, Dr. Herman Edelin, who's been very involved in piloting hey, that process, nice to see you. Um, is on the, on the system as hey, well. Yeah. Um, and I think the approach that, that certainly some layers use is this is a way of, of developing. Um, a co cohort of people who can mediate in this area, and they've gone gone a long way to do that and gain that experience. Um, we could open up for Herman to explain the approach. I am just, however, concerned that we've got time constraints. Yeah. Um, and there's one well, other I, interesting I question we... that's been raised about whether you are in the UK you're ahead of the curve than we are in terms of COVID-19 as well. Have you had to deal with any um, COVID-19 cases? No. Oh, no. no. No, we've only done things differently as a result of COVID-19. I'm sure someone somewhere will think of a way of suing someone for uh, failing yes, to probably. do something, I'm afraid. Um, it, it, it certainly must be quite a headline. But we are, we are yeah. mediating online and, uh, and, and, and it works pretty well. I, I think on the other question, I think there probably is a much too long debate for this 
arena. But just on your point about developing a cohort of people who are doing this well, I think that's that's really important, really important. however you do it. Yeah. And certainly what we've done over here is to, because of the tender process, uh, for who, which providers are going to be uh, providing mediators, that they have selected mediators, they've, they've trained them, there, there are not so many of them that we don't get quite a lot of experience quite quickly, and I think that's important. So whatever methods, it's very important to get a cohort of people who uh, can do this well, because mediation can get a very bad name very quickly mm. if people okay. do it badly. Yeah. And you all know that in other contexts, professional contexts. So, yeah. So, so things have really heated up, but I am I am concerned about respecting time. So I'm. Unfortunately, I have a conversation to have. One of the very conversations we've been talking at about at eleven o'clock yes. uh, with a with a solicitor for a yes. claimant okay. to uh, do exactly what I've been talking about for the next uh, last hour and a half. Fantastic. So this is a good time to wrap up. Firstly, just to um, to to mention um, as part of the slides, there's a link to the NHS resolution mediation review report, which is extremely fascinating to read and certainly can give us in South Africa a number of, of pointers on how to, how to do things going forward. Um, so please make use of that. Um, secondly, also just to say that that same report indicates that 74% of the NHS um, mediations are being settled and that just is is further motivation to stay in this field to keep um, to keep pushing towards the disputes in our system um, to be mediated um, to ensure I'm quite surprised that it's that low to be honest Marion oh, yes I mean I oh, reckon, really? yeah I, I keep a tally and I reckon look but never mind. This mediated is, settlement figures yeah. are not relevant, but no. I'm reckoning that well over 95% of the mediations I do never reach trial. I think I've only had 10 cases in 20 years that have actually gone to a trial. Okay. Yeah, I mean, this is according to the report. So, yeah, sure. yes. I mean, we yes. can, we can we don't know. investigate that further. It's all headless runs and dragging it. No, that's not true. That's <laughs> there, may be, uh, <laughs> there may be other mediators who are, who are at the other end of the average. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. But no, they're very pleased and, with the settlement level. Mm. And then finally, just to say, I mean, it does seem that that even though you're far ahead of the of the of our of our situation, and you're doing literally hundreds of these mediations all the time, there still seems to be a change of culture that has to happen, um, a shift in terms of who takes responsibility, who's in the room during those mediations, and it's just interesting to see how that develops, and hopefully, um, us taking some of those lessons and and instituting them earlier. Um, in order to to change the culture um, in the sector and and make mediation more useful. I'm going to give you an opportunity to close, but from my side at Conflict Dynamics, just to thank everyone for joining. It seems to me as if there are many, many areas that we can still pick up on and explore further in this area. And we would really appreciate if you'd use the next few minutes on the chat just to give us a sense of whether there are specific areas as, as people who've joined this call, whether there are specific areas that you'd like us to pull a webinar or a meeting together on. Um, also just to mention, Jacqueline, you raised the issue of, of regulation. There is a move afoot um, to regulate the industry, including for clinical mediation, mediators, but for mediators generally in South Africa. And I refer you to DISAC um, to take a look at their website, but DISAC is also involved in trying to set up a professional body where we would all be able to be regulated and, and disciplined and supported in the work we do. So just keep an eye open for that. Um, Tony and, and Heather, would you like to wrap up from your side? I just want to say goodbye. Thank you for participating. And um, it would have been nice to answer all your questions. We couldn't have time for that, but um, I I've really enjoyed it. And I just want to wish you all very good luck. This is a very important area and it's great to see so many of you taking a real interest. So Absolutely. All and the please, very best. Please, we can learn from you. I mean, I I I'm really interested to know how 41A works, both generally and in relation to clinical negligence. Um, 
it, it, it's a, it, it goes further than anything we've got in writing. The word mediation doesn't appear in the civil procedure rules, apart from uh, Rule 78, which is something to do with the, the European Directive yeah. on Mediation. Yes. But the word mediation does not otherwise appear in our civil procedure rules, and it does in yours. And uh, that's, a, that's a really good well done. step. Well done <laughs> on that. But it'd be very interesting to see how it plays out and whether you've actually uh, are going to generate, whether the judges are going to generate some pressure, uh, which might actually encourage the funders like MPS and the government to, uh, to push lawyers into doing it. So thanks again. Lovely to see some faces we know. Yes. Herman and yes. Trevor, we can see, and Patrick, Patrick. and Mohammed. Ra uh, and, and, uh, so, you know, and, and there are others of you who will know us and we yes. may not remember you. So, but anyway, it's been great. We really yes. have enjoyed ourselves and keep in touch and maybe we'll meet again in this way sometime. Keep well, keep safe, keep busy, keep going. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. And thank you for your for your time, Tony and, and, um, and Heather. And thank you for everyone else for your time. We'll drop you a note with some of the links um, that, we, that we've discussed today and um, look forward, to, yeah, keep an eye out. We've got a number of, um, of sessions coming up next week on Rule 41A, so join us for those. Um, if you are not yet an accredited mediator, please take a look at our website as well. We're training our first group of online mediators. We'll be training our first group of mediators on an online um, way in the beginning of May, but certainly we train mediators and once you're yeah. trained as a mediator, we also, um, you know, do the medical, the medical legal training specifically. One issue that's come up today is the whole issue of training um, law for non-lawyer mediators, which is something that we'll also look at. So keep an eye on us. We certainly will keep you in the loop and thank you very much for joining us today. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.